Welcome to Below the Line, where we talk about working in Hollywood from the crew perspective. My name is Skid. I'm a former assistant director and your host. For the fifth year in a row, Below the Line is talking about the Oscars. Our approach, each episode, I host a panel of film industry professionals to discuss the nominees in their category of expertise. Now, longtime listeners may be wondering, what happened to that DGA episode that normally opens awards season? Well, if you're a fan of that episode, that episode is now. We've morphed that conversation into a focus on the Oscar nominees for achievement in directing, but my guests today are that same group of assistant director friends. Now, if you're of the vocal minority that ask, why do you have Sean O'Banion on that show? He's not even a member of the DGA. Well, you are going to be disappointed because he is back. Suck it, people. Suck it. <laughs> we'll get started <laughs> with all the guests. First up, Katie Carroll. You're a member of the Directors Guild, currently working as a first AD, and you are a DJ nominee this year for your TV work on Lessons in Chemistry. So congratulations and welcome back. Thanks so much. I'm hopefully within a week, I'll be able to say a winner, but maybe not. We'll see. We're crossing our fingers for you, Katie. Crossing fingers. Also returning is Bill Hardy, DGA member, first AD, and sometimes producer. Nice to see you again, Bill. Hi, Skid. Hi, everybody. Next, Roger Mendoza. You're a DGA member and currently working as a second AD. Welcome. Hi. And finally, as hinted, Sean O'Banion, you're still not a member of the DGA, but you are both a member of the Producers Guild of America and a fellow podcaster. Always glad to have you on the show. Welcome. Hey, Skid. Thanks for having me. Hello, everybody. Well, glad to have everybody here. To start, I'll list the five films nominated for achievement in directing. Anatomy of a Fall, Killers of the Flower Moon, Oppenheimer, Poor Things, and The Zone of Interest. We're going to discuss them in that order, and spoilers are possible, so consider this awarding. First up, Anatomy of a Fall, directed by Justine Triette. I haven't seen this one yet. It's high on my list, but <laughs> I got nothing. Besides Katie, has everybody else seen this film? <laughs> All right. Uh, Bill hasn't seen this film either. Oh, and I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, all right. So, Roger, Sean. I enjoyed it. I've seen it. I enjoyed it as well. Who? Let's talk a little bit about what we think of the film overall. Oh, I think it had one of the best um, arguments in a film that I've ever seen between a couple. That was That was one of the best directed arguments I've ever seen on film. Say more. What did you like about it? It, that that slow burn tension when you're actually in a relationship with someone and and you you start to argue and and that little thing starts building and building and building on and 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 I, I've never seen somebody actually direct something like that. Usually people are just straight up arguing and it it was just such a slow build to it. It felt so so realistic in the way that he directed the the trajectory of the of the argument. It made it feel very real to me. I feel like you're describing why I'm alone in life, Roger. Yeah, yeah, same. I, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Uh, it, 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 was, it, it was it was just very well handled. I think all his directing was very well handled. Oh, and and the dog, the dog was amazing. <laughs> I hate to say that if there was a, a, a role, not not to make light of it, but if there was a, a if there was a award for best animal performer, that dog should get it. The dog is a big part of it as well. Get, the get the a big part of it. Do what and, she and, needed and, to do. And and, and and she she's definitely, in my opinion, she she should win best best actress. She was she was phenomenal. I I, I didn't think I would like the film at all. Um, I I still I still um, you know, you get to the end and, and, and without giving it away, you still you still make your own opinion about wh who murdered whether she murdered him or not. I guess I gave it away. But um, uh, which I found very interesting. It, it wasn't. It, 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 it didn't really point you in a direction, but it did. But it, it lets you make your own assumption at the end. Yeah, I think the ambiguity is is intentional. Like on that, that's that. I, at least my wonderful. takeaway was like someone asked, "Well, what yeah. did I think happened?" Yeah. I'm not sure. I'm supposed to think that I know what happened. Just the the whole breakdown of the marriage overall is really the story. Yeah, yeah, very much so. And it's like at a certain point, it becomes a, a trial movie. Right. Although it's a very interesting trial if you're if you're not from that part of the world, because it's taking place in like three different languages at different moments and everything feels very real. I I had the whether you consider it fortunate or unfortunate opportunity to sit on a murder trial in a jury at one point in Los Angeles. And it was a lot 
like it's depicted in the film, which is to say that sometimes you have questions in your head that just don't get answered through the case by either side. And you're sort of like, aren't they going to ask about that? But you don't get to direct the questioning on either side. So you just have to say like this, okay, this is the information we got. And this is what we base our judgment on. on. Um, yeah. Your decision on. And, and it's really fascinating to see that play out. And we're so used to like, you know, law and order or something like that, where it's sort of very cut and dried and we know who's who, and we know who's the bad guy and we know why it was done. And in real life, it's never like that, you know, or rarely like that. So I thought the film, especially for you guys who haven't watched it yet, it does an amazing job of simply sort of presenting life and at times almost feels like a documentary style. Not that it's, you know, shaky cam or anything, but you feel like you're spying on stuff. And it's a weird voyeuristic feeling as you're watching, as as Roger was saying, this in particular, this fight that you weren't privy to prior to the trial that you get to see a slice of and you're just like, wow, okay. I don't know how I feel now. I don't know who's, I don't know if, if she did it, if, if, if he did it to himself, if it was an accident. Like, I don't know. It's pretty impressive. It was the first, I think the first like 40, 45 minutes or so, I'm just trying to get into it. And then it just, it just took off. It was, wow, this is an incredible film. This is, this is phenomenal. It's worth noting, we'll come back again to talk about sort of the films overall that were nominated this year, but this is the only um, female director nominated. Surprisingly. Well, having not seen it, so I can't attest to it, My every time somebody talks about, quote unquote, a snub, and we'll talk about Barbie and Greta Gerwig, but my argument back is, okay, who would you take away from? And I definitely have my opinions on that, because I think there are people who deserve to be on this list less than Greta Gerwig does. But again, it's all opinion, so it's hard to say. But I'm excited to see this movie now. <laughs> yeah, and again, I don't think we've, spoilers, yes, but I don't think we've given anything away. Next on our list, Killers of the Flower Moon, directed by Martin Scorsese. This is the one that I think doesn't necessarily seem to be on the list. I am so glad really? to hear you say that, Katie. That's... I thought I was going to be standing alone again uh, this year. <laughs> here's the thing. I did like it. That doesn't mean it's one of the best movies of the year and or being 10th best or 11th best. It's still a really damn good movie. It's just not necessarily is it though on the short list for me. Okay, we might have a spectrum of opinions on this one. <laughs> <laughs> Roger, you enjoyed it, it sounds like. You want what do you want to say? I, I thought it was I thought it was incredible. That that it was it was um the best gangster movie he's made yet. It was it was I thought the whoa, performances were whoa, great. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> it was it just felt it felt so big to, to me it just felt it, it felt so big and so nuanced in a lot of ways because of her performance and also Leonardo DiCaprio's performance which I'm not a fan of in particular you know, like I've never really been I mean basketball diaries I, I loved them there but but aside from that I've never you know really been a big fan and and I thought this is this was an amazing performance in playing this fool that's being taken advantage of like can't can't uh get away from his from his evil uncle you know and, and it's killing his wife but he's still in love with her it was it was this uh in, in, in every frame it's just big it's it was just such a it, it felt like an epic almost to me I mean, everything that you look at in the background everything is moving there was there were there were there were the street felt alive it, it, it was it there was just so much detail and it was so vibrant in so many ways that I couldn't I couldn't stop staring at it. I didn't want to like it. I just, I'm just not a fan of the long three and a half hour movies or, you know, it's just, it, it, it was, it, I didn't want to get into it. And I ended up really loving the film. Um, there, 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 there's a scene where there, um, where, where the, all the FBI men come together and, um, and they're all talking about how they're, how they're, they've learned different parts of the case at this oil field. And in the background, uh, the house catches fire Right. And, and, um, and the ranch, um, Hale's ranch catches fire and, and you, you start into cutting that with him poisoning his wife and also trying to poison himself. And you can see it all burning down in the background because the house is, is got a view of, of the, of the glow of the fires through the window. And, and, and it was, it was so indicative of everything that he was going through. And I thought that was brilliant. It was so 
so well done. And I'm also not a big Scorsese fan, but this this movie got me. I thought I thought it was one of his better films. Well, we're going to come back to the because it's funny the things you like actually I have specific problems with. That is though two movies in a row, Roger, that you started not liking the movie. Do you actually like movies, Roger? Is that <laughs> I, always I, I, is that could be lately, five movies lately, in a row for you? I, lately, I do, I, I go in to watching the movie not wanting to like it based on my previous experience with the director's previous movie or some movie within his catalog. And, um, and, 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 and I've been present, I've been uh, pleasantly surprised this year by, by what I thought would not be good. I will say, I think it's his best movie in a long while. Best movie mm. overall, that's reaching. Maybe. But also. <laughs> yeah. what, what, what do you think is his best movie, Katie? I mean, between Raging Bull, Taxi Driver, Goodfellas, sure. Casino, I mean, Casino. four that are yeah, arguably yeah. I mean, listen to how crazy you are, Roger. <laughs> <laughs> listen to her describe how crazy you are. Yeah. <laughs> I, I I just, I didn't think he had that in him anymore. And it, and but that's I, it. I, I, I it's wasn't like, expecting it's like that at all. You're surprised that he's gone over the bar that he set over the last 10 years that doesn't make it great. It just makes it great oh, for him right. in the last 10 years. It's a, it's a sliding scale. Listen, in fact, so I'm going to go on record then. I'm gonna, I, I actually think there's a lot of talent at work here. I think in all the other categories where people get nominated, that's fine. Like it's all, you know, production design, et cetera, et cetera. Like there's just good stuff in the movie. But the movie itself is not good. I mean, it's not the biggest problem I have with this movie is it's not focused properly. Like focusing on Leonardo DiCaprio and Robert De- and, and, and De Niro, those characters that this movie just gets convoluted all around. And, and, and in the end, you know, that's why you end up with this very weird radio show little thing at the end, because the actual ending for those characters is not satisfying in history. They don't like they go to jail for a little bit or they, you know, and so it's just this sort of the movie should have been about the Lily Gladstone character. 100% agree. If it had been focused about her, uh, and I'm not saying, you know, I could have written it better. Jesse Plemons doing better investigation, watching that investigation would have been, like, I, I, think- I read that that's where it was supposed to be, right? Yeah, that's what the the, the novel... It was supposed to be, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio was supposed to play the Jesse, the FBI investigator yeah and 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 then they 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 changed everything so that that they could focus on the relationship it, it more so the, than, than the investigation the movie's not well focused and then what you end up with is a lot of you have a three and a half hour movie where you still have an exposition scene like the fbi still has to get together that very scene you're talking about roger that's a problem for a movie <laughs> this long that everybody has to get together and explain what's going on and in fact they start doing flashbacks Within flashbacks, <laughs> like they like cut, and you're like, well, wait a minute, what is this before they tried to kill her or after they tried to kill her? And so the whole thing just starts, and again, beautifully shot, right? But it just yes. starts to fall apart. And then you end up on top, then you start to notice things like there's these jump cuts, like two of them jumped out of me. When when Leonardo and Robert De Niro first sit down, their drinks just hop into their hand. And then also the that lovely vista shot where um, Lee Gladstone and Leonardo DiCaprio are facing each other with the cars. Then it jumps right in that they're face to face. And that feels like they're not getting coverage on the day. Scorsese abandoned, uh, you know, continuity a long time ago. If you, <laughs> I mean, you can I, yeah, I honestly, agree. he and Thelma, if you go back to Gangs of New York, their shots where like Cameron Diaz, there's a melee going on and Cameron Diaz is like way over on one side and in the next cut, she's like right next to, you know, somebody else. And you're like, well, wait a minute. What did she morph there? Like, yeah, um, it wasn't, it was continuity. I was watching, I'm like half the yeah. time I'm watching and somebody's arms are crossed and you cut back to them and their arms are down at their sides. I'm like, but in the over, I didn't yeah, see They, the, they like, literally it, it, don't care anymore. Scorsese's like, I'm cutting performance. I don't give a shit if the cigarette is the wrong yeah, length. The or the drink is that is not bad, full. then it takes you out of the Moving on. <laughs> All of it feels like a director that isn't collaborating anymore. And he's got his idea about how it should be and isn't listening to anybody else. And that's, I mean, I'm not saying it's still Scorsese and he's still surrounded by great people and they still spend a bunch of money. Um, and it looks great in places, but he has done better, not in a while. I don't think I've liked any of his stuff since. But the other thing is, I mean, obviously, you know, awards, subjective, all that, everything. But at the same time, 
you know, you do have to sort of take into consideration, although the Academy members often don't, that you are just judging this movie. You're not supposed to judge his catalog that preceded it, which includes arguably better films. You have to just judge this on its own merit as a story. Um, I agree with Roger. I think it's one of the best things Leo's done. Um, and I'm a fan of his, but I, I do think it was an incredible performance. And then he didn't get an Oscar nomination for it. So you're like, well, okay, I don't know. Um, I like the film. I don't think it needs to be the length it is. I think by the time you get to the trial stuff at the end in the last like 30, 40 minutes and they start re-explaining things that you watched two hours ago, I was like, God, help me. Don't do this now. We already said we know it. We know it. So don't do this. Skip the trial, <laughs> whatever. And, and I really like the score, the late Robbie Robertson. I, I thought right from the first music cue in the film, you're like, OK, we're in Scorsese land. This is like I get it. He's operating at, at you know, top of his field at 81 years old. Um, and yeah, I, I don't think it's his best, um, but I also don't think it's it's at the bottom of his, um, you know, resume. And one thing I think like he constantly works with Robert De Niro and Leonardo. Leonardo DiCaprio, obviously. And they all have a working relationship with each other. Great. I think both De Niro and DiCaprio are miscast in this. They are phenomenal in it, and they probably brought something to it that was phenomenal. I wonder what the movie would have been if it had been two different actors, because they are both too old for the roles. Like, Leonardo DiCaprio comes home, and he's, like, fresh from the battlefield from World War I. His character should be like 25 years old. He's pushing. Yeah, 50. but like 20, 25 year olds looked like 50 year olds back in the 20s. <laughs> oh, back in those days, huh, Roger? <laughs> right. <laughs> and then, like at the end, I'm thinking, okay, Robert De Niro's probably too old for this, but okay. And at the end, they say he died when he was 80 in 1947. So he's supposed to be mid to late 50s during all of this, and he can barely go up or down stairs. So in uh in what Roger probably thinks is his worst gangster film, The Goodfellas, you know, he, he he is playing that was such a bad film. <laughs> De Niro does play a 23 year old. I think the first time you see him, he's when he comes in at the craps table or whatever. Right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so what Roger was saying earlier was like the original. For for anybody who doesn't know, the novel, the the, yes. the book, not a novel, the book, David Grant's book is about the birth of the FBI and the discovery of what was going on in Oklahoma with the Osage and the investigation that created the FBI and solved what was going on down there. Um, and that was what Scorsese and Eric Roth had written. That was the movie. But then essentially the Osage got word that the book had been purchased and was being adapted. And they basically said, if you tell another wait, save your story about our people, but without our people, we will pick it. We will make a big deal. You guys will be wrecked. And they went back and sort of like reanalyzed the book. And we're like, well, what is it? And DiCaprio, as Roger said, was supposed to play the FBI agent. And DiCaprio was like, well, you tell us, Marty, what's the movie? And Scorsese said, well, it's Ernest. And uh, I forget her character name. So that's when they switched it. But I, I feel, I think, I forget which one said it, but um, I feel like she got short shrift. At a certain point, they got, you know, three quarters in the movie and were like, well, she just lays in a bed now and she's getting poisoned. So what else can we do with her? So let's just really make it about, you know, De Niro in the jail looking at DiCaprio in the jail and we'll just do that. And so I was kind of like, boy, you, you pitched the whole movie. You sold the whole movie on her, on Lily Gladstone and the Osage. And in reality, you didn't quite nail that. And I feel like there's probably a way to do the formation of the FBI and finding out what's happening in Osage County without making it a white savior. You didn't have to shift the focus to not tell that story. Find a way to rewrite that story because I thought that would. I don't think they made him the white savior though. He was more like well, that, the white. Well, that was the point so, that they so didn't they... want to make the FBI agent the white savior for solving this crime. So okay, let's shift the focus off that story. But then the savior is not the FBI agent. The F the savior is Lily Gladstone's character for going to DC to say, "Hey, we need help. You have to help us. You created this problem. Help us solve this problem and involve." 
the county and the Osage members and create that story as opposed to these other two white guys who are creating the problem yeah. in the first place. I'll give you another example, too. There's a moment early on where all of the Osage women are sitting on a blanket and they're at a wedding or a party and they're looking over at Leo and they're talking, oh, he's kind of handsome or whatever. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, you as an audience member, at least for me and my girlfriend, we start asking ourselves if they knew that these guys wanted their land rights and wanted their money, why would they consent to marry them? Why would they want to? And so you miss that whole thing of character with her that they just never touch that you, she just marries him and they know they're getting scammed and you're like, but, but what's her side of that? What's her reasoning? And it would have been much more interesting to me to see it. To bring Scorsese's talent and all the, you know, resources that he can command, that would have been a sharper, tighter, more interesting movie overall. And the fact that it fails, I think that falls at Scorsese's feet. Like, I think that the movie we get is because yeah. of him, not because, well, I, you know, some studio made me work a bad script. That's not the case. It's his movie. And that's why I don't think it should be on this list. Hard to agree. Bill, were you going to put it on the list until Roger said that it was the best ever? Or where are you falling on this? <laughs> I, I still love it. <laughs> the truth is, I was just really happy that I had seen something uh, for this conversation. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, you know. Thanks for I'm being just, here, Bill. Thanks. <laughs> thanks. All right. Good night. See you guys next year. <laughs> I, I uh, mostly I was just glad that De Niro wasn't de-aged digitally or anything like that. I mean, like, let's let's yes. I, I think at listening to yeah. all of your complaints, I'm like, OK, they're right. All right. All right. It, and I and I started to it started to dawn on me just now that, well, at least it wasn't the Irishman, I think, is <laughs> yeah my overall feelings yeah. on it. Like, I, I completely agree that it could have been uh, Lily Gladstone was the one I cared about. I was fully recognizing the fact that it was drifting with Leo and uh, De Niro, that, that other guy, De Niro. And uh, it wasn't the movie that I wanted it to be, but I was still OK. I, I don't know. I feel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I feel the same way. I like I, I don't dislike the film. Exactly. I, bet, well, I used to do this DGA movie nomination podcast. And, on, <laughs> and there I would have said, uh you know, it's it's you know, it's still the AD's dream. It's still like, look, the horse cart. You know how many times that horse cart had to walk by? Had to be reset. Like, yes, exactly. Like the AD in me definitely yes. gets excited sometimes when I start seeing hundreds of extras, and I forget yes. something like, oh wait, maybe this isn't the best movie. So, I <laughs> and it was during COVID. They shot yes. it during COVID. I I had to interview uh, the location supervising location manager who many of you probably worked with uh, Mike Fantasia. Mm -hmm. And I mean, what they did just to take over that main street that, you know, in, in Pahuska doubling for, I forget the other, the real town, but I mean, my God, it's no wonder the movie cost $200 million. It, it was astonishing what they yeah. did. There were some really, really amazing like camera shots, like walking through the house and really setting the tone, seeing the family in all the different rooms. And I mean, I've said it before. I'll say it again. I'm a sucker for a really good winner. There are this some was really good. Isn't that, again, isn't that right? also? Isn't that all also part of? No, the, it's Prieto. I think being, being the oh. best director, right? Like being nominated. Because the, the scope of the movie was huge, and it was beautiful to look at. I don't, right. you, you, like I, I enjoyed the performances. I understand the flaws of of. I understand the flaws, and you guys have made me realize much more than I wanted to care about. <laughs> <laughs> no, but but I think overall. I, I I still think it's 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 a it's a wonderful film, you know. If you if you if, if we I think we all pick apart the the things that that most audience members won't won't care about, and I think the things that that worked in the movie would would be well suited for the average moviegoer, where they would be like, yeah, this is you had a great performance. Oh, I like the fact that they focus on the villains, except for the expectation that people are going to be in sitting in a theater for three and a half hours, Roger. Like that's. Sure. I got lots That's of people have not watching this movie for that reason. No. And to what Sean said, we're not, we don't dislike the movie. I still really like the movie. I just don't think it's necessarily one of the best 10, 10 best movies this year. And finding great moments and great things to appreciate about it. Sure, maybe it's the 11th best movie. 
that doesn't make it on the top list in my mind. I kind of disliked it, <laughs> but that's just, you know. <laughs> I feel so and silly. For, and for what it's worth, what we were saying, like Sean, what Sean was saying about uh, Marty and Thelma, like long abandoning continuity. They've also long abandoning actually editing. Like you look at Casino and Goodfellas <laughs> and Raging Bull and Taxi Driver, they're right around two, two and a half hours at most. <laughs> Somewhere along the line, they're like, oh, I'll hire Thelma, but I won't actually cut anything. I did reach out to Adam Somner to see if he'd come talk about it. He was the first AD. He didn't write me back. I don't know whether <laughs> he's busy or just didn't want to talk about it, but uh, yeah. Well, he's uh, also not, you know, he's not Scorsese's usual first, so there was that sort right. of Scorsese because he doesn't often leave New York. I mean, he did for The Aviator and, and he did for Silence, but he stays close to home, so for him to go to Oklahoma... He had to take, you know, a window of time because of weather and things like that. So he had to take a first that he wasn't used to. He had a new production design. Actually, when they started that movie, they had an entirely different crew all the way across the board. And then when they decided to pause and rewrite the script and basically took, I think, six or eight months. I can't remember what Mike Fantasy had told me. But when they came back, everybody was new except for the DP. It was a whole new art department just across the board. And that's pretty wild, you know. Which makes me wonder how much prep they got in and got into the concept and the tone of what they were trying to do with this new script. What I was told was the first iteration was, um, I don't want to say less historically accurate, but but more um, impressionistic of the time. And, and then once... Um, you know, Jack Fisk, the production designer came in and people like that, they were like, let's really like, let's research the shit out of this and let's do the history. Let's make everything not according to what we visually think it might have, but let's make it what it was. And which I really, you know, I, I mean, Skid, you said it, all the technical categories were top notch across the board. Well, we're going to move on to the third film on our list, Oppenheimer, directed by Christopher Nolan. I saw this. <laughs> oh, good, Bill. You should talk this off. Yay, <laughs> Yay <first>. Bill. <laughs> this is the one where I feel like this is why I wasn't happy with anybody else's nominations because, you know, maybe this is nobody else bothered putting out their best work because they knew that Oppenheimer was coming <laughs> out this year. Like, like I, I kind of feel it from the moment I saw the trailer, I was kind of like, this is going to blow everything else out of the water. And then I saw it and it did. I, I I don't feel like everything else is just filling in, is our seat fillers this year. I feel like with Oppenheimer, it's phenomenal. It's maybe a, a little too long when you just look at the time, but never felt it. Yeah. I was on the edge of my seat for a dialogue movie. Like there's no, there's no giant gimbal sets where everybody's a fight scene in a hallway or anything, you know, it's just people talking and I was leaning in literally nonstop excited. So I, I think uh, visually performance story, I was, it was all there for me for this one, for sure. I, I was a little worried and I do, it was hard as I sat there watching it on IMAX in the big screen, not the screener. So I'm like, that was worth it. hundred um, percent. I thought the first hour was a little, too exposition-y. It was way too much setup, and the dialogue was too rat-a-tat-tat. -tat. It was very David Mamet. It was like, what are we doing here? But once they got to New Mexico, those last two hours were so phenomenal. I, I didn't dislike the first hour as much because I could appreciate what the setup was. So the first hour, I was a little antsy and a little anxious. I'm like, I don't know if this is going to be as good as I keep hearing it is. And then the last two hours are so great that i'm like okay i can i can deal with that it was really really well done i still have a few complaints here and there but overall fantastic i'm not going you guys won't like my opinion this time <laughs> <laughs> thank you um um you notice that 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 um i i think the first time when i was i was in high school i saw i saw momento and i it was uh, it blew me away it's like these, this guy is amazing. This is amazing. Um, um, his nonlinear storytelling really, really um, got to me, and, and continued doing that through all these films. Like my favorite, my favorite Nolan film is Prestige, and and um, the Prestige. I thought it was wonderful, but it, it just feels like um, like he took all these like 
all his nonlinear storytelling skills to a whole new level in this movie. And 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 it it just felt so wonderful and big and epic and 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 the the, the story. I feel like Nolan's characters are or film his characters and his films are always um always about destruction or self destruction. And what better way to say that we're going to destroy ourselves than you know telling a story about the guy that created the nuclear bomb? It was it was um it was. I don't know. It, it, it just gra- I, I was so absorbed and grabbed by it. And, yeah, this character that's that that's not you, when when he starts getting questioned and um and he's in his little trial and and he won't stand up for himself. He's just going to let himself be destroyed because he he essentially is the person that destroyed the world. So he feels like he my he, he deserves it. Then you have um what was Robert Downey Jr.'s character's name? Straws. Mm-hmm. And then you have him destroying himself because of his own hubris, and and I'm uh, trying to destroy this uh, Oppen- Oppenheimer because of of some perceived slight that happened years and years ago. It was it was it, it was, and I didn't see that coming for until, until you know obviously he gives it to you in the end, and it, it was it it just left my jaw on the floor. Just I, I can't I can't say enough about it. It was it was it, it was. It was the best Christopher Nolan movie. I feel that it's the best film he's made, and I don't think any. I don't. I don't think anybody wins. Skid, were you able to uh, watch this movie without running uh, anywhere and blacking out? <laughs> Spe- <laughs> speaking of memento, that that was. Uh, yeah, no, I I kept my seat uh, straight through. I was well watched. I saw it at an Alamo theater on their big screen, not the IMAX, but. You know they can they'll bring you food and drink and can pace yourself easily on that. So yeah, no problems for me on this one. When I saw it, I remember I saw, so I saw it in the theater in August, and at the time I said this is the best film I've seen. I hope it's not the best film that I see all year. It turns out it was, but it, I was really I wasn't as taken by it as, for example, Everything Everywhere All Once the year before or Dune. That was my biggest disappointment this year with the strikes. I wanted to hear how Katie thought about the finishing on Dune since <laughs> she had such harsh things to say about part one. I'm sure we'll talk next year. I'm next sure year, yeah, we'll it, put yeah. a pin in that for next year, <laughs> one, one, one presumes. But I think Oppenheimer's great. I think it deserves every award that, it, that it's going to win. I wish there was something else that I thought was competing with it. It's no one's best work for me as well, I think. But I wasn't that sort of really in- taken by it, if that if that makes any sense. And Again, maybe it's something about coming out in August versus the stuff at the end of the year and the jockeying for things at the end. That's a decision they make on the marketing side. But I was hoping that there would be more for me this year. And and Oppenheimer really kind of peaked out for me early. Do you feel that um, because it's so big that uh, other movies on the list that are smaller don't have the same chance at, 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 to fairly win? It's a good question. Right. Like, I mean, I don't know. We'll talk more about overall how we think things laid out. But uh, again, fantastic film. No complaints about it. And and what all of you guys have said about sort of the culmination of Nolan's work. Like, I feel like he had to make all his other movies to make this movie. It's a good point. Yes. The the first time I saw I saw it in IMAX 70 millimeter, which was pretty incredible. Like, I mean, as soon as it's, I, I don't remember if I've ever seen anything in seven, 70 millimeter before. And as soon as it came up, I literally audibly was like, holy fuck. I mean, it was just like extraordinary. Uh, On the first viewing, and I've watched it twice now, the thing that threw me off initially was the slipping of time between the black and white sequences and the lead up. So I was a little bit lost. And he obviously, you know, like reveals the Downey Jr., the straws bit at the end and how um, Alden Ehrenreich is sort of twisting him up. Um, and I was glad that he sort of made it plain for me because in that first year, I was like, what, I, what, where, where are we? <laughs> where is, what timeline am I on now? Um, because I didn't know anything about, you know, what happened in the later years. So it did throw me off, but having watched it again, it, it it's just, it's a master stroke of a movie. I, I'm and everything, the editing, Jennifer Lame's editing, you know, uh, Ludwig Gorenson's score, the the idea of using like 
I don't know all the stuff they were doing. It's just so well put together. It, it astonished me. And I think you're right, Skid. Like, it's surprising that they dropped it in the in the summer or toward the end of the summer rather than releasing in September or October, November, somewhere around there as like their big awards play. But I guess they knew they just like Universal was just like, no, we, we got it. I mean, this is it. We can put it out anytime and we're going to carry through. Yeah, it's a big summer blockbuster and also awards. And I, I think the last time that I can think of that was was like Avatar or Titanic. Like it was a summer blockbuster, arguably even more so because of Barbie. They helped each other. But without Barbie, it still would have been a summer blockbuster. Yeah. Yeah. I think what's what's most astonishing, though, is like it's just people talking about stuff and talking about science and physics. And you're just like, what, what you know, why is this so incredibly compelling? And obviously you have this phenomenal cast. You have Killian Murphy, who's paid his dues with Nolan for 20 years now. And you have Florence Pugh and Emily Blunt and Downey doing something radically different from, you know, he's so not the cocky Robert Downey Jr. that we're used to. He's not, there's no moment. But of also Tony he kind of sort there. of is. <laughs> he's, but he's loose because he's got a physicality. Like yes. I look at, I've worked with Downey. So like I watch the way he walks and I'm like, there's that swishy Downey walk. Those, <laughs> you know, he kind of throws his legs up, but like, he just, I mean, there's a reason he's, he's nominated as well. Like he yes. transforms, he does something. He like reined himself in or Nolan reined him in or whatever. It's just, it's really impressive. Yeah. My only two complaints, which are both small. I mean, one is not small in concept, but is the Emily Blunt and Florence Pugh characters are just so like his mistress, his wife, like far none, like not really that important, but arguably in his life they're not important like we just see how they affect him we don't see them as characters so i'm willing to kind of put that aside because it's about him and what affects him and how his life is shaped so if he as a character doesn't see them as full people or how or that on his equal then that's fine because that's his perspective and the only other, but she does get that really. The, yes. Sorry, not to cut you yeah. off. I want to hear the second one, but she does get that moment in that sort of weird sort of trial thing in that tiny room later, where she's the only one who really stands up for him. Yes. And and I thought that was if if they're gonna play her an Oscar scene, it's probably gonna be that moment, where you know they're questioning her ties to communism, and she's like, "Fuck you guys! It was 17 years ago. Like I, you know, he's gonna sit here and be quiet, but I won't." I thought that was pretty great. But what's, right. what's the second one? Well, which is apropos of absolutely nothing, but they filmed so much at the Wilshire E. Bell Theater here in Los Angeles that every single time I was like, oh, I filmed in that room. I filmed in that room. I filmed in that room. I know that staircase. I filmed there. I filmed there. So for a split second, it took me out of it. But then I'm like, okay, nope, nope. I'm back in. Okay. And that is not his fault because it's a beautiful building. It is. He's nominated for adapted screenplay too. I don't know if you guys know this, but it's a fun tidbit. The whole script was written in first person. Really? So every page is I walked into the room and took a seat and they looked at me and all that kind of stuff. So it's kind of a trip to to read. That is actually a really fascinating concept. I now want to go re-see the movie with that script concept in mind. It completely changes the way I might see the movie. What you said, how how he would have perceived his wife right. or the other woman. And like that literally is the whole script. It's everything is me, 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 and what I'm doing and what I think and who I exactly. like. And That's who I'm he doing. was. Yeah. Because this one is a uh, location re relevant as opposed to story development. But uh, yes, well, the Wilshire Ebell, I almost, it reminds me of film school when the <laughs> professor said that we weren't allowed to shoot at the reservoir or the cemetery because every final film <laughs> had a scene at the reservoir and the cemetery. <laughs> the Wilshire Ebell is on that list. For that's that's the first thing I think every time I see that staircase in the back yes. of the, the the main room. I'm like, oh, go back one year to the Fablemans and you'll see it about fifty times too. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. No, it's it's definitely the period. It's like there are other buildings that have survived the seventy years. Can we in L.A. Can we go shoot in some of them? But I guess whatever it, the holding and the parking is extraordinary. yeah exactly the parking across the street makes it all worth it right? <laughs> base camp across the street exactly all right we're going to move on to the fourth film on our list poor things 
directed by Yargos Lanthimos. Am I pronouncing his name right? Yorgos. Yorgos. Yorgos Lanthimos, yeah. That Greek guy. What do you guys think of Poor Things? I didn't get the screener until last <laughs> night. <laughs> I, yeah, I watched it this morning on a screener. I, randomly, I thought it's it's weird, but I like weird because very little is weird. Everything everywhere all at once was weird, and it was cool because it was weird. It's a very weird R-rated version of Barbie. There's so many parallels between yeah. it and Barbie. As I watched, I'm like, well, Barbie had that moment. It's a naive woman in a very surrealistic version of, quote, real life, realizing the misogyny around her and fighting for equality. It's their, their A and B side of the same record. <laughs> That's what I got. Yeah, I, I can't wait to watch it tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a huge fan of Lanthimos's other films. I do like the favorite because it's probably the most down the line based in some sort of reality that we have a connection to. Whereas this is very fanciful. Um, the, the Frankenstein aspect of this is interesting. I thought Emma Stone's performance is off the charts. The, yes. this, this idea of spoiler for people who don't know, but she's basically a baby's brain transplanted into a grown woman's, but her own mother's body after her mother has passed. And she now has to figure out how to live. Um, and Willem Dafoe is this sort of Dr. Frankenstein that's done this and has all sorts of, you know, pug pigs running around and <laughs> just weird, weird stuff. But that's what he does, right? Killing of a sacred deer is weird. The lobster is it the lobster. Yeah. 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 Really lobster is one of my weird. favorites. I don't know for me. I can't I, I can't connect to a lot of his movies because they're just so outside of anything that I find it hard to like get into it. But I absolutely appreciate every element of it in terms of a director. You're like, well, there it is. Right. This is just his vision and whatever team he's put together, the production design of wherever it is, I forget that they go on their trip to and the boat itself that they go on. And like, it's just all stunning to look at. I still find it a little bit at a distance as I'm watching. I'm like, wow, this is gorgeous. That's amazing. But is that intentional? Because he used so many wide lenses and super wide lenses almost to keep us at a distance. Even the close-ups looked like they were on a 10 or a 14 or something, and they were abnormally wide for a close-up. Yeah, but I don't mean like visually at a distance. I mean, yes, that that is all true. And and he wants you to be a spectator to what Bella Baxter is experiencing and, or, you know, or deciding or feeling. But I just mean it's so fantastical because she's not, a, you know what I mean? Like who, when you watch a movie or when I watch a movie, I'm like, okay, who's who do, who do I connect with here? Whose experience am I like, well, I know what that feels like. Or, you know, I, I've done that or I know somebody that's done that or whatever. And we're usually looking for a way to sort of project ourselves into the narrative somehow and connect to that. And his movies very often for me, I find that I can't do that because everybody's a little, a little, you know, above what we're used to in life. Um, but again, I appreciate every element of it. Does that make sense? I feel like the way that I felt like... Um that brought me into the film where the men in her life and how, how each one of them wanted to control her in some way or, 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 and, and that's, that's, that's how I found my way in. Cause at first I'm like, this is crazy. And then I, I watched it again and I started realizing that it was the, it's, it, it, the story, the story is about her and her overcoming these, these, these men um, very much like Barbie. <laughs> I mean, even yeah, it's at about the end, possession. Yeah, they, they, all, want, they like, all want. Christopher to Abbott says, "Like, okay, okay we can her. talk all we want until we get a gun." And I'm, in my mind, I was like, "Or you could talk all you want until you get a guitar." Like, it's there's so many parallels to Barbie about and like men possessing women and women saying, "No, I'm going to be my own person." It was I, I loved them both, and I thought this one had a director's vision all the way through, as much as Barbie did and as much as Oppenheimer did. That was so clear and so obvious and so cohesive that all the departments work together with Yorgos's vision that I really enjoyed that aspect of it all. 
Yeah, I thought it was next level stuff for him. It's the only movie on the list that I watched twice. It's, it's I, I had to rewatch it. It was just like no way that he actually got away doing got away with doing this. <laughs> This is wonderful. Yeah. I mean, there's a thing <laughs> in the movie where at least a couple times Willem Dafoe randomly leans back and burps a bubble up <laughs> into the air. Yeah. And it just kind of float. and it's never nobody ever goes, What the fuck are you doing? What are you okay? Like, what's happening? It's just a thing that happens in Yorgos's world, and everybody's good with that. <laughs> I mean, you're just like, well, okay. This is also a thing that happens that like they're surprised when Willem Dafoe's walking and he's like, well, I took some heroin between the toes for the pain and cocaine because I like it. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> sure. I, I like when they're they're in the boat for the first time. They're having dinner with the couple and she's like, she's like the baby's crying. She's like, she's like, punch the baby. <laughs> it's just, it's just so, many, so many memorable lines in this movie. It's hard. I actually really, really enjoyed it. I had, I thought it was a really well done and really great movie and just also fun to watch because of the weirdness. Agreed. It's not going to win, but that's okay. Because <laughs> of the weirdness. Well, you know, good win production design, stuff like that. Yeah. Although, no, the uh, vote for Barbie will be for production design and screenplay. We'll come back around to Barbie. <laughs> yeah. Teasing the Barbie keeps conversation. Yeah. While we're still talking about the Oscars, our final film on this list is The Zone of Interest, directed by Jonathan Glazer. Who saw it? Who has not seen it? Roger and Bill haven't seen it. Okay. Well, I almost didn't see it. I got to admit, when the screeners were out, um, I just said, oh, it's the Holocaust movie. And I was like, I just don't want to watch a Holocaust movie right now. I'm just, there's so many things to watch. I'm just really not in the mood. And it wasn't until... Then the nominations came out and it's, you know, in sound and here. I said, oh, I need to go see it. And so I went and saw it in the theater and did a little more research. I hadn't realized that Jonathan Glazer was the director when it was just, you know, on the streaming app. And and if I had, I probably would have watched it sooner because uh, Sexy Beast and um, what, Under the Skin, right? The yeah, and fiction birth. Uh, birth. Birth, I haven't seen. Um, but the other two, this is only his fourth film. And if I had known that he was doing this, I said, oh, I, I, I want to see it. And so, yeah, I saw it in the theater. Um, and uh, it's a really powerful film. He's doing a really good work here. Yeah, I absolutely. I mean, yeah, like you said, Skid, it's like, oh, it's a Holocaust movie. And we've all seen a thousand of them. And we should keep watching a thousand more. It's a, always There are always more stories. But your first thought is like, oh, my God, can I watch this again? And like, yeah, it's finally from the point of view that we've truly, I don't think ever seen before. And it was fascinating to watch and to see like how often they cut away right at that moment, right at the moment we might see something like, and it, it kind of not justified, but explained how some people could have lived through that time. Cause like they have to put blinders on, they have to do this and, or they choose to put blinders on because it's good for them because they get furs and jewels out of it and gold and, and the, the the production design of the wall just on the other side and his children's laughter mixing with children's screams. And sometimes you can't tell the difference in the sound. Like, what what am I listening to? Am I truly listening to both or is one drowning out the other? And which it's, it, it messes with your head a little bit because you are wondering how are you, you, the family, like dealing with this? How, how do you do that? How do you live right next to how? How is that possible? It it was super powerful. I hadn't how it and how it, he played it and worked it out. Well, also little things like the celebration of a birthday. Yes. While on the other side of the wall, people are being shoved into gas chambers. I mean, you're just like, if you think about it, they all. It also shares the same actress as um, Anatomy yeah, of a Fall, fall Senator, mm-hmm. Senator Hiller. She's equally impressive, e- equally impressive in this movie. Um, but for completely different reasons. But there's a thing that is, I'll tell you what I, what I loved and what I struggled with. What I loved was that it is it is a depiction of the banality of evil, the famous quote, right? You're watching people who are willfully committing themselves to living life as normal and gardening and welcoming the in-laws and having birthday parties while they know they're killing thousands of people per day, literally on the other side of a wall, 20 feet away. What 
what I didn't love so much was the the sort of, you know, when he just goes to the red screen and you just hear the weird Mika Levi score. And I was just kind of like, I don't need that. I'm 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 already with you. I'm in it. I'm in it and I'm feeling disturbed. And then you do that and it's like you're trying to poke me more as a filmmaker. And I'm like, I don't need you to poke me. I got gotcha. you, yeah. you know. So there was that there, there were some things that he did that I felt were manipulative and unnecessary in a film a that was hat, already, you know, yeah, to be, you know, to use the name of his previous film under the skin. He was already under my skin. The whole thing was, I mean, from the very <laughs> first shot of them just like chilling by the lake, hanging out, having a lovely day in the sun. I was like, oh, this movie's going to really mess me up. <laughs> um, and it did. And, but also like the very last where the guy is in that hallway and he looks back and you you see, quote unquote, the present and they come back to him. Like that was fascinating. Like could for a split second, did he actually see that he's on the wrong side of history for that moment? Or is it just staring off to space? I mean, I think he was because right, he was like he wasn't puking, but he kept spitting like he was sick. And and there's a line, not to spoil for people, but there's a line where he's at a party event, a Nazi party event, and he's in an upper level of a room. And as he looks down, he later in that scene, he talks to his wife and says, I'm standing up there and I'm looking down and I'm thinking how much gas would be necessary to kill all the people in this room. And he, But he's looking at Nazi officers. And you're like, she blows past it. Mm -hmm. You know, like that's she she's more interested in, you know, putting on the lipstick that she found in the main coat that was clearly taken from the people brought on the train and all these kind of things. And you're just like, my God, these people, you know, to to either convince themselves that this any of this was acceptable. You know, I, I'm, I won't go off on a tangent, but I have a project about a Nuremberg prosecutor who died last year. Um, and I'm probably going to The Hague in June for his memorial. Um, but among the people that he put on trial and one of them was responsible for the murder of 30,000 people a day, yes. he was, he had a double doctorate, uh, this man, he was a double doctorate. There was a mayor, there was an opera singer. The, these were the commandants. So to watch a movie where you're seeing these, these clearly educated people, just convincing themselves that this is all cool was like viscerally upsetting. I think your point, Sean, I also didn't, um, there are a couple of things like in like the infrared, you know, what the point of that was showing the woman yeah. at night and just kind of some of the decisions he made, I'm not entirely clear on. It's not really one of my favorite films of the year. Overall, I thought it was a bit much overall, but to take this material and to present it in such a new way, doesn't necessarily surprise me that he's on this list for achievement and direction. Yeah. I mean, I think if you look at, all of the people on this, maybe with the exception of Scorsese, actually, they all made very specific and clear directorial choices, stylistically, um, visually, auditorially, in terms of their sound design, like we we're just talking about, you know, in 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 this one, um, it's it's pretty impressive. All right, well, those are our five Oscar-nominated film listeners. If that's your only interest, we're done with that now. But before we wrap. <laughs> Let's talk about the differences this year between the DGA nominees and the Oscar nominees in this category. Oppenheimer, Poor Things, and Killers of the Flower Moon are nominated in the Best Director category for both the DGA and the Oscars. But in place of Anatomy of a Fall and The Zone of Interest, the DGA instead nominated Barbie and The Holdovers. So let me hear your thoughts about the rankings for both of these awards. I think they got it right on Barbie. I absolutely think that was very... <sighs> I, I think the Oscars missed the, the boat with not nominating Greta Gerwig. Um, whether or not she deserves to win, debatable. I did love Oppenheimer. But Barbie was another movie that had very clear directorial choices that absolutely told the story, that could not have told the story without those choices. Production design, casting, the music, even just getting Ryan Gosling to play Ken. That perfect choice for that. I. Everything that is right about the movie Barbie was because of Greta Gerwig and she absolutely should have been nominated in my mind. 
I also thought Barbie was a stellar achievement. I mean, that was a tough needle to thread and uh, she managed to do it in a way that you could take this commercial product and tell the story she told with it. It, it is to her credit. And I would have liked to see her on the nominated list here as well. Yeah, I agree. Agreed. Eh. <laughs> or the DGA really doesn't like Sandra Huler since the movies that she was in, those are the two that the DGA didn't pick up. Uh, I also really liked um, The Holdovers, actually. It's one of my favorites of this year. I think Alexander Payne did a great job with that. So, uh, it may, Maybe it's a, it's a flashy thing. Like, it's not flashy enough, but that was exactly yeah. what I loved about it. I, you know, I'm a, I love Alexander Payne, but, you know, I find myself always going back to Hal Ashby and this is a very like Harold and Mauld is one of my favorite movies. And th- I kept thinking about Harold and Mauld during this. There's no, uh, it, there's no correlation with the story other uh, really, but it's more of an art direction thing. But um, I really loved Paul Giamatti in this. Like I, I he's the, he, I know he's the secondary focus, but at the same time, I can't, you know, my my eye was constantly drawn to him and there's a little bit of a he looks just like my dad too but which is kind of weird <laughs> i was more attracted to divine joy's performance through the whole film yeah but, but she was exceptional yes she was amazing too like i you know i like that play aspect that once you get all the other characters off the stage now, there's basically like three, maybe four main characters that you're going to spend the rest of the movie with. Like, I, I really like that. Well, there's one moment in the holdovers I didn't like. And because the movie is so good and so subtle throughout, when he says to him, oh, yeah, we can go we can go to the cemetery to pay a visit to your dad. I was like, oh, that's a little on the nose. Like, I wish they had just gone rather than have to say that out loud like to, to draw. Because everything else about the movie went without saying it out loud, I thought. And that, so that part really stopped for me. I was like, ah, I wish he'd made a different choice there. But other than that, yeah, it was one of my favorites. Yeah, I think you're right. It was just so subtle. So just there, but it made it easy to watch. Everything else, you're like gripping your seat or or frustrated or annoyed or involved. And just nice to watch, which... Nice Christmas movie. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. And I thought I thought the young man whose name I don't know, but he's never acted before. Apparently, this is the first thing he's ever done. And I thought he was excellent, too. Yes, it did make me feel old when I read that uh, he walked. I think I read it on IMDb, but he walked over to the phone and the crew suddenly realized he had never worked a uh, rotary <laughs> phone before. <laughs> <laughs> He had no idea how it worked. I was like, <laughs> oh, my God. I heard somebody talking the other day. They're like, you know, think about how much time has changed. Like, you can't you can't make that movie present day because they can just call an Uber and get in a car and go yeah. away. You know, like, yeah. it's wild to think of just that element of it that that changes it. Almost all road trip movies are going to have to be period movies from this point forward. There's the great scene in Harold and Kumar when they go. Oh, I left my phone back in my room. Oh, forget about it. What's what could possibly go wrong? Let's go ahead. And I was like, well, they they just ruined my entire class. Like, you know, in the age of cell phones, you can't have a good road trip movie anymore. No, you can break the phone, Bill. <laughs> that's a, that's good. You can break it. <laughs> Throw it out the car window. I actually saw, and this is a real thing in a Reddit room on movies. This girl asked the question and she said please don't get mad at me please don't downvote me or whatever she said were pay phones a real thing or were they just put in movies so that people could like slam the phone down <laughs> on a corner somewhere and i'm old That's enough to know great. that they were also so. yes. i'm old enough to remember when they went from a dime to 20 cents so you just put in a quarter and they just made an extra five cents and that was extra money yeah. to them yes I was kid. The one other movie I wanted to mention that is not on either list, but frustratingly so, was Spider Man Across the Universe. That's why it's the on Spider Verse. Spider Verse, excuse me. We'll see if you voted for Across the Universe. That's why I didn't get enough <laughs> votes for you. Well, so it's nominated for Best Animated, and that's the one where as soon as that category got created, animated movies that could have been nominated for Best Picture kind of got relegated, and very few got nominated 
if ever again. And it was very frustrating because that movie, in my mind, is truly the best picture this year. Really? It was beautiful and phenomenal and heart-wrenching and great and told a great story in two hours. Thank you very much. No, uh, but, actually, but Katie, th- that movie ends on a cliffhanger. You hate that. I was going to say, it's no, part no, no. one. It's, 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 no, part it's one was part two, two, which it was part two, of the, but that... It, Katie, you're, you're my new favorite person. <laughs> no, I would have said that about the original, the first one, which I thought was brilliant that year and deserved one. This one, I thought it was actually too much of what made the first one good. But I didn't like the second one as much. Truth be told, I, I, like I thought it was a spider. It landing, was this, but... So did I. It was. It's the Empire Starts Back of the exactly. Spider Verse movies. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah, it's it's brilliantly thought out. Everything, all the color motifs, the score should have been nominated. I, I don't know the why the score was nominated. Styles of animation, it's definitely the tell best the different film score. Yes, beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> and they do yes. that. They do that with the score as well. The score always is always part of the storytelling. It, yes. it always changes with the characters. Um, the, the color palettes change with the characters. You know, if, if you pay attention, you'll the color palette and the score will tell you what's going to happen next. Yes. It's, it's so brilliantly done. There's there's such great filmmakers. It's like it, it, I loved it so much more than I loved the first. Yes, I should have. I love you. Yes, Katie, thank you. <laughs> and that's another one though, because it's voice. You can have someone who's probably too old to play the character, but play the character because the voice ends gravitas to the character without them looking like they're too old. And like, okay, this guy's seen some things or whatever. And then it works that they're too old to play this character. Well, I'm, I'm looking forward to the third one of those. We'll see what they do with it. <laughs> Other really films am. that people want to draw attention to? I want to call out Past Lives. It's on the list for first-time director for the DGA. And I think that's my second favorite film of the year, actually. It's just quiet and subtle in a way, even more than The Holdovers. I think Past Lives, people should check that out if they haven't already. Really nice film. Um and what's interesting about it in particular is that there's no villain. There's nobody who there's a husband character who comes in later and you keep waiting for like, when's the jealousy come? When's he going to just be an asshole? And he doesn't. And you're like, wow. Yeah. I've not seen that before. Yeah. That movie's really well done. And I think Katie, I think the a 24 streamer on that did not expire yet since you can still vote for it that you can actually go watch. Versus okay. all the others that just poof disappeared uh, <laughs> when the voting closed on the nominees. Uh, there was one other interesting, another movie on the first time director list was American Fiction. And this is kind of inside baseball, but I, I to get your guys' thoughts. There was a lot of churn on like Facebook of DGA people saying that wasn't a DGA movie. Why are they, why are we voting for that? And I'm wondering if people think that the guilds and unions should be closed to only members or is it proper to say, you know what, that was a great film and it wasn't a DGA movie, but he deserves to be nominated for best first time director thoughts. Same thing that happened with Moonlight. Moonlight wasn't a DGA film. They got nominated. Yeah. You can't really do it with first time directors. I can, I can, I completely agree in the best director thing, you know, or at least, uh, we'll offer you a membership here with your nomination. And if you turn down the nomination, you can turn down the membership, you turn down the nomination too. But first time directors, it's almost a recruiting thing, honestly. I think it should probably stay open. Like again, if a movie's done outside, yeah, I'm all pro union, but if a movie is done outside and it ends up being best, then we should recognize that. It's my understanding that 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 sometimes uh, you know how much money they have to put in for everybody that's a union member, especially DJ, is is um, is cost prohibitive. You know, so you got if you're going to make your movie, sometimes you have to go with non-union crew or or people that are willing to make the movie. I produced three features, and there is no way we could have made those movies if we were guild at all. There just isn't, and and you know if you look at our credits you'll notice there are some guild people who were there uh under the radar that that helped us because we wouldn't have been able to make the movie without professionals quite no, they weren't that far under but, the radar if they were in the credits <laughs> <laughs> well they may have different titles than than they're used to i'll put it that way um but it, yeah and it's a certain point it's not that we didn't want to because i would rather have just been able to pay them you know, their rates and give them what they're supposed to get and give them the titles they're they've earned in other places on other movies. But, you know, at the at the budgets we were working, 
you know, my first movie was 150 K all in, including post. The second movie was not much over that third movie. We had a bit more money, but we had to spend it all on, on the, the actors. So we were sag. We just weren't anything else. And I just find it all curious right, well, how many, oh, sorry, go ahead, Bill. I was going to say, well, join us next year on <laughs> should Sean O'Banion join the DGA. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> I think that that they should there should be a um I, I know there are tiers for for your budgets in your films but you you should also allow people that want to join an onion in film to get it done to go there without having to be penalized for for having helped somebody complete their film once you're union uh, you, you know like how are you going to get uh, people that know what they're doing or hope that you can you know like so, so many people actually do help and I speak from experience I've been I've been on a film and every everybody got in trouble. Yeah, I heard <laughs> that. All moon, I heard that Moonlight crew got <laughs> fucked, Roger. It, it, that's it, that's well, not what I, the rumor I, is. But it was it, it was how how else was the movie going to be made, right? And like like it, it, it would it, I always hoped that they would come up with some other way to be able to help the filmmakers make their films at that point, right? Like where instead of instead of people having to hide or change their names or give themselves different titles. And my two cents is if they're going to be nominated opposite DGA movies that are nominated, if DGA directors like, well, that's not fair. It's like, well, no, it is fair. Make a better movie. You've got the money. You've got the resources. If this movie, which wasn't DGA or was and didn't have all the same resources you did, still created a better movie that was better directed, what's your excuse? Go make a better movie. I got no problem with them being nominated, especially if it means that in the future, if they join the DGA, they get more resources because now they're on the radar of studios, then good for them. Having worked with enough of these indie people, I, I would hazard a guess that if any one of these were extended the opportunity, they would jump on that immediately. You know, the the entry fee might be a, a barrier for them, depending on how much they got paid for their little tiny movies. But I would, you know, I don't think there's anybody in this day and age who's like, be part of a collective bargaining. Ah, oh, fuck that, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and actually Cord Jefferson, I'm pretty sure he's WGA, right? He, he wrote on succession and some other stuff, uh, the director of American fiction. So uh, he's obviously a, a, a union member on one side. I'm guessing he'll, he'll join, uh, quickly, swiftly. I also, just to touch on that movie, uh, did, have you guys seen it or no? Ooh. You haven't seen American fiction? It's I yeah. saw it. Uh, it was great. I, I really it's, liked it. It's, yeah, it's great. Yeah, really good. And it it's it's sort of talking about threading a needle again. It's another one of these movies that sort of rides a line of funny but emotional in a very realistic way. And I thought he really accomplished that. There, there, you know, there's a lot of that is down to that cast um and, and how great they all are. And they were well, you know, at least two of them are nominated. But yeah, very, very cool movie, very fun. There, there, there was so much chemistry between between the cast members in that film. It, was, it, it looked like everybody was having fun. And Jeffrey Wright, finally. I still haven't seen it, but I'm a fan of Jeffrey Wright from yeah. way back. And he's always brilliant. So to finally get the recognition, I love that. I'm not that big a fan, Katie, if you haven't even bothered to go see his movie. Right? That <laughs> seems... It's, I'm going to see it. I'll see it before <laughs> the awards. I got, I, uh, I got a week. I got a week. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you got a week before uh, before the DGA nominees are, are decided. Okay, so guys, I, I do have one question for you. Since you've all worked so closely with, with directors, um, the Guild is only still five directors, right? For five movies, right? But when the Academy expanded to 10 nominees for Best Picture, do you feel like they should have expanded the Best Director category to 10 nominees? Because I always think you can't have the best movie without the best director. They touch everything down to like, you know, sitting in on a scoring session and saying, you know what, I'm not, I just don't feel the trumpets. Can, can, can we bring the trumpets down? The composer is like, yeah, yeah, let's, let's do that. You know, so I know it wouldn't be exciting for like a TV viewing audience because in theory, then the best picture wins and the best director wins, but maybe you combine it or something. But I just wondered how, you know, working so closely with filmmakers, if you feel like if you nominate 10 movies, but only five directors, are you are you leaving off five people who controlled everything on that process? I'm torn because I hear what you're saying and you're 100 percent right. I wonder if there's a way to do 
weighted because like best picture is actually up to 10 depending on it's a voting in a weighted system so right. sometimes you might have nine year, or, right yeah nine this year and i wonder if there's a way to do the same thing with directors for the same reason but more weight given and i don't know how to gauge this but more weight given if the picture is nominated for best picture because what drives me nuts is if you have nine nominees and you have five nominees for best director and you have a best director nominee but their movie is not on the best picture nominee list which does occasionally happen it's like how is that possible yeah how is one of the nine nominees for best picture the director may or may not be nominated this director is but their movie's not I, that makes no sense to me and it's frustrating it's people that deny the altor theory <laughs> basically you know it's like we're as members of the dga we're kind of we've kind of latched onto the altor theory where it's, you know, it's the director's movie. So, well, if it's the director's movie, then who are these best picture people? And they would be Sean's. You know, it's, <laughs> it's uh, you know. <laughs> I'm surprised, looking at this best picture list, how many of these films don't have the director as a producer on their own film? That's uh, There's a number of them where it's just the producer and the director's not listed. I To answer your question, Sean, I'm a little more cynical about the expansion of more best picture because uh, I think that was more how do we recognize films that are doing great with only five things? We just need to have more. How do, that... how do we recognize the Dark Knight this year, guys? Yeah. How do we do that? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, what are we going to do to, you know, because with the five, you're, you're, you're just not getting a flavor for all the movies that are out there or even all the movies that represent where the industry is and what's doing, going well in the industry. Yeah, I don't see a need to expand the other categories. I, I think that would be it starts to become superfluous and I don't know, it's probably good that we're fighting for just five spots and all of these things that there can be snubs, right? If you start having 10 of every category, then I mean, the snubs are part of it as well. I think for better or worse with the it's industry. an award ceremony, not a participation trophy. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't the best picture award more uh, producers award? Than best picture producers producers award. Yeah. So. Right. So it's a, it's a little bit different, right? Like, you, like you, it's more so about the people that made that movie possible than. Yeah, but none of us believe that it's possible. None of us, except for maybe Sean, thinks it's possible to have a best picture without being the best director or at least in competition for best director. Roger, you're with, supposed to be with us on that. <laughs> I mean, that's the, the auteur theory, right? I mean, if you go right. by the auteur theory then the best picture is made by the best director. If you don't subscribe to that, which I actually don't because I've worked like you guys and I know that the movie is made by everybody. My One of my favorite directors was Sidney Lumet. And he said, they shouldn't call me a director. They should call me a selector because people put things in front of me and I go, I'll take that one. And I thought that was brilliant. So, you know, I think to, to say that's an auteur is, minimizes everyone's contribution, including yours. I mean, but there are, there, I, I would say there are a few a few directors where I would say that, that everything that happened in that movie happened because of that man's choices. And, and regardless of, of anything else, there, everything there happened because that guy had a very singular vision. I would say something like poor things. I, I don't think that's the case all the time. I think the majority, and even then there, there's so many of us that are involved in making and helping with that, uh, make, helping that vision come true translating it so that everybody else understands it and sees it and it's also that any any given day the plan can go to shit and everybody just has to pivot and go well what do we do okay how how do we, you know the location fell away so what do we do with that and everybody sort of puts their heads together so to say that anything is under just one person's uniform control is not realistic no, but there's also like it's the director who who probably hired the production designer, the costume designer, the location manager. Other people said, hey, consider this person, consider this person. And it's the director who finally said, you're my person. You're my department head on this because of the selections you will bring to me. You will bring me things that I hadn't even thought of. And that might spark me to think about seven other things. So choosing the department heads is part of being the director where that helps create the film because of the department heads, but you chose them because they brought ideas that you hadn't even thought of. Yeah. I don't think the auteur theory is the singular force of vision. It's that it guides all of the creative efforts, but what the, the final yeah. product is well, that the result of, of, of being guided by one person who, right. who 
in that theory is and should be the director. Yeah, this is we're yeah. way deep down the film theory <laughs> rabbit hole right now for those <laughs> people that have lost us. Like, you know, it's you can you can do this for your class, Bill. <laughs> no, no, it's it's total. It's you are complete. Literal doctorates have been written on what we're talking about right now. I'd like not respectable doctorates, but there are definitely <laughs> doctorates that have been written on the auteur theory. I mean, it's and that's the that's the whole. Yes, it's the director. We fully recognize everyone else's contribution, but it's. I mean, I always go. I, and I don't mean it to sound because Sean, we all. I think this is one of the things we don't talk. Why we don't talk about the auteur theory, DGA people <laughs> in general, is because we don't want to accidentally offend any producer members of the DGA too, because <laughs> because they may hire us further down the road. But you know, it's that if you think about a film like you think about paint, a painting, you know, the painter is you know the the people that make the paint itself are very important but they're not the painter that's i i know that is an oversimplification of the conversation but uh because i fully recognize everyone's contributions it's those moments when shit goes down when you just when for my own mental health i go so my fucking movie man and I just go and I do it. <laughs> I do what I was told to do because of the auteur theory. <laughs> but, yeah, I did say to a director on my second movie, though, if you want to be a dictator and only have your ideas up there and nobody else's contribution, then go be a painter because then you well, can choose. There it you go. Color. But you also you, you also don't have these conversations intentionally have these conversations on a film set for just this reason too <laughs> yes yes you know, not on I'm, set. no i'm no. not going to stand there with a with my po pole and go this is my movie <laughs> you're ruining my movie why are you ruining those, my movie some have yes those some have. Have. we've all and that heard word it. gets around and we all know who they are exactly yep. exactly but now you guys are ruining my podcast you're like totally going off on the side this is Sorry, my I took us off on a podcast tangent. Podcast, and you guys are ruining it. <laughs> this was fun as always, guys. On that note, we're going to call it a wrap. Great having everybody. Yay. Thanks, Yay. Yay. Thank you, Skid. Plan on being back next year when we will talk about Doom 2. I can <laughs> promise that that's <laughs> going to be on the list. That will be our focus. Yeah. My favorite film I haven't seen yet. <laughs> <laughs> Probably mine too. <laughs> Listeners, I always appreciate your feedback. You'll find my contact info on our website, below the line, one word, dot biz. That's B-I-Z. Our Oscar coverage is solid, even if we went off in the weeds a little bit on this episode. So do subscribe to the podcast if you haven't already. Thanks to Curtis Five for our music and John Juan for our logo. The logo is available on t-shirts, mugs, and stickers at redbubble.com. To all of our listeners, I appreciate you. Please rate us wherever you get your podcast and tell your friends. Thanks again from Below the Line. Fun to see that live. Nice the ending. And what? <laughs> the the ending. The roll, the rap. It's not a recording that you just like stack on the. I end. like it's to, fun I to watch mix it up. live. Sean asked me why I do that, and one, I mix it up a little bit every once in a while. Meant the Oscars. Two, it gets you guys thinking about the publicity as well, and makes the guests have to think, oh, hey, maybe I want to go get a mug <laughs> or something, sell some <laughs> stickers. Uh-huh.